Doc and the captain are back. Drew and Aaron are back together, and we have a special guest, Dr. Davis. Uh, you all might be familiar with our Run Lab connection, and if you haven't, definitely jump over and check that video. But today, Drew, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about uh, one of the most common uh, complaints with runners is uh, knee pain. Uh, but before we get started, uh, Dr. D, you want to tell us just a little more about what Run, Run Lab does? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we're based down here in Austin, Texas, got a couple of facilities here, um, but we've got some uh, virtual options and some partnerships all over the, the United States. And uh, what we primarily do is work with runners, uh, really athletes of any variety, but a lot of the time with runners um, about uh, working on their biomechanics and helping them understand their movement patterns and their structure and the way that they move uh, related to the way that they're built and how that differs from person to person. We're really big on the concept that there's no right way to run and walk and move. And so that's what we help people understand is, is more about their own bodies, their structure, their range of motion, their strength, and then, then how that movement pattern overlays on top of those things. And then we help them improve from an efficiency perspective or work through injuries if they're having problems with their run or whatever sport they're participating in. So that's kind of the foundation of what we do. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, you know, let's start on that topic of knee pain. Um, what do you think uh, is the biggest cause from your, you know, from all the experience you have with all the videos that you guys take? Yeah, we've, I mean, we've been in, in business for seven or eight years now. So we've seen thousands of runners at this point and uh, anywhere from kids with Down syndrome and cerebral palsy and all kinds of stuff all the way to Olympic uh, gold medalists. So we've worked with a lot of uh, caliber of athletes, if you will. And uh, knee pain is the number one complaint across the board in this population. And uh, I think if I were to choose, I don't know that I can choose one cause, uh, but there, I think there is one issue in the industry that we should probably discuss here today. And that's the concept that it, there's really, when I talk about there being no right way to run, a lot of times you read these forums and things, people will get on there and talk about their knee pain. And usually the, the response from the community, whether they're medical professionals or just runners who are trying to help out in these forums is, oh man, I, I, need, I stretch more. You know, you need to stretch more. You need to get uh, stability shoes because maybe you pronate too much or you need to shorten your stride or whatever. And so you're, you'll hear all of these things in relation to knee pain. And I think that's a challenge in the industry because you get all these runners out there that are maybe stretching already overly flexible muscles or trying to correct for pronation when pronation isn't really a bad thing. Um, but there's just a lot of misinformation in the community. So it's hard to pin down why knee pain happens because there are so many variables in a person's body that can tr contribute to it. But a lot of times what we see here, there are a couple of things that we see with some consistency. And those two things are hip weakness and that's a really common one and it's not there's i don't know how you feel about this whole thing with your glutes aren't firing and whatnot but this has <laughs> run rampant in the industry in the last like 10 years and it's a it's kind of a ridiculous notion because unless you have a neurologic disorder your your, your glutes are firing <laughs> they might not be as strong as they need to be and they may not be doing the job they need to do in the context of that functional movement, but they're working. But a weakness in that frontal plane or the, the, the plane basically that stabilizes your hips when you run, that's a really common problem. And what that does is translate uh, uh, extra load down into the knee joint, down the kinetic chain. And so then the knee ends up getting injured because of it. So that's one, one kind of underlying etiology behind a lot of knee pain that we see. And then another one is just a mechanics related issue. And this is really common in new runners, especially, but runners of every variety that have struggled with knee pain over and over. A lot of times they just overstride. They're sticking their leg way too far out in front of them when they run. And it's such a common problem. And the thing is you'll read out there in the running world that, uh, you know, that, that a heel strike is bad. And we feel very strongly here inside of this facility that it isn't the heel strike that's bad. It's the overstride that's bad. If yeah. you land on your heel, but you land with a bent knee, your quad muscle is able to eccentrically lengthen and absorb shock the way it's meant to do. And that's perfectly fine on the knee joint and a perfectly healthy way to run. The problem is 
people equate this landing on the heel with the knee pain because when you land with an overstride, you almost always have to land on your heel. So that's kind of a correlation causation issue where it's not really the heel strike that's the problem. It's the overstride and the landing with a straight leg that overloads the knee joint. So those are two things we see. I don't know. You probably have some thoughts as well from your end. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I agree absolutely a hundred percent with you, which is kind of funny uh, that, that we're in perfect agreement here. Um, I always uh, <laughs> tell people it's not wrong to heel strike. It's, it's wrong to have, and I, I talk about more the orientation of the tibia. So I always say, your tibia needs to be vertical. You know, bones are meant to be loaded vertically in, you know, in force. They're not meant to be bent. Bones don't bend. If you bend bones, it's bad. So, um, you know, yep. that's really what I, what I preach. And, you know, if, if we get somebody with a, a nice vertical tibia during their running um, and they're still heel striking, I say, that's okay. That's just how, the, how you do it, um, which is, I mean, we're, we're dead the same um, on that. You know, with the, the glute weakness, um, I've read a bunch of research studies showing, you know, weakness and correlating to hip drop. And then um, the one research study that I read, they actually improved their glute strength and they still had the hip drop. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't buy into that adage of it's not turning on. Well, of course it's turning on. You, you're either weak right. or you just don't understand when to activate the muscle. So, you know, turning it on, maybe you're not turning it on at the right time. Um, I don't know if that's what they're thinking with that, but yeah, we're, we're in perfect. It's crazy. Right. And then these people yeah. end up, and I mean, I, I could go on on this concept all day, It's ridiculous, <laughs> but they end up in these clinics that then are, they say, well, let's do some, you know, hundred clamshell exercises. What is that even doing? You know? And so I think the treatment philosophy is also very flawed in that these yeah clinics and medical professionals who really should be looking at movement patterns and looking at the way the person is moving and why that knee is being loaded end up in a clinic that kind of takes this cookie cutter approach and says, ah, you know, you, we need to make your glutes fire more. Also, let's just rub on the knee and make it feel better. Well, that doesn't fix the problem because almost always, if you think about the way the knee joint is bent or is built, it's not a, it's not a, a joint that has a lot of movement in very many planes. It moves mostly in the sagittal plane. It's mostly just a little hinge joint. And yes, there's rotation. But at the end of the day, it's almost never the knee that's the problem. It's almost always something either above or below. And so seeing a problem in the hip joint with a weakness and a stability issue, what ends up happening is people go online and they read, oh, I need to stretch more. And then they stretch their hips and they go do a bunch of yoga. They end up with all this flexibility in their hips that they can't control because they're not strong enough to stabilize that said hip. And then all the stress goes right down into the knee. And then they get knee pain and then they chase the knee pain and say, oh, it's, it's my IT band. It's my patellar tendon. It's whatever, whatever. But at the end of the day, if you don't solve that functional weakness at the hip above the knee joint, that knee is going to continue to be loaded and is, you're never going to solve that issue. I read them. Um, I read a study just recently because we're looking into statistics around our, the efficacy of what we do um, from a research perspective. And uh, there were some stats out there that are pretty prevalent that say that 91% of people that have patellofemoral pain syndrome, even with treatment, still have that issue a year later. And 70 to 90% of that, those people have recurrences up to 20 years later, people are not solving knee pain with our traditional treatment approaches. And I firmly believe it's because one, we're not looking at people's structure first and saying, okay, somebody who has knock knees needs a different approach to knee pain than somebody who has cowboy legs or neutral knees or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and also the fact that there's just this, this prevalence out there of data or not even data, just people blogging about the fact that they think that there's a right way to to foot strike and a right way to run and blah, blah, blah. But nobody's really getting to the underlying root cause, you know, looking at the biomechanics behind it. So I think it's a real problem in the industry. Well, and again, like you said, Dr. D, if we did a cookie cutter therapy session, a lot of the times that's not even going to give that individual that mental connection of what they're trying to accomplish and what muscles they're trying to activate in that particular running pattern. And if we do not connect the dots in that particular case, they're still going to go out, like you said, and run incorrectly because they're not correctly keeping things taut or moving in the right plane. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and people, one issue that we have, and I don't know, I would love to hear your thoughts on how, how you guys do with your clinic up there. But one thing that has to happen to change movement patterns is a ton of repetition. People have built these movement patterns over 20, 30, 40 years of running. 
and they come in, they're like, okay, let's shorten my stride. Well, knee pain starts to feel better, but then they go out and they don't work on the foundational pieces of that movement. And so then of course the stuff comes back. We treat running very much like a swimmer would treat swimming and we break down the component pieces of the run work those component pieces and then put the whole thing together so that the functional movement improves. But at the end of the day, people don't learn the skill sets associated with running like a swimmer does or a soccer player does. And it leads to so many problems because we need to work on this repetition in a clinical environment. And then they need to go home and practice it a thousand times at home to change that movement pattern. And so I think that's a piece of it too, is that people have this sort of misconceived notion that they can come in and just, you know, magically fix this pattern and that their brain is then just going to fire that way forever more and their knee pain is going to be gone. Well, it takes, it takes a lot of time to rebuild those neural, those neuroplastic pathways, you know, just like it took to build the, the issue in the first place. So I think the, the strength is one component and then the repetitive motion and training the neurologic system is another component to really fixing the issue for the long term. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I'm changing someone's cadence, uh, you know, try to change their overstriding, um, it's typically, uh, I mean, two, three, four week process just to get them yeah. to where they need to be. And then at that point, then we, then we watch their average cadence, watch their average cadence and make sure they don't kind of revert back to old habits just to make yeah. sure. Yeah. And they, and they want to, their body wants to, as soon as it starts to fatigue, even a little bit, and as soon as they take their mind out of the game, you know, it goes right back to its most comfortable pattern, which is yeah, the thing exactly. that ultimately probably caused issues in the first place. Yeah. Um, we should talk about too, I would, I would love to hit on a little bit about pronation because I think I could talk about that every single time we do this. And I still think people need to hear it a hundred more <laughs> times to break down what the industry has been shoving at them for the last, yeah. you know, 30 years as far as pronation being bad. So I don't know, do you want to talk about that or do you want me to kick it off or how do you want to do it? No, I'd, I'd be glad to take that one. I'm sure we agree on this one too. Um, so <laughs> what I tell people is everybody pronates and it's normal to pronate. The question is, are you over pronating is, is what, I, what I tell people. And if, uh, you know, I always want someone to start out in the least, um, you know, the shoe, the, that's the question. What shoe's good for me? So I'm like, what is the least invasive shoe? If that's, if that's a word we're going to use here. So if they need, if they need control, because they can't do it with their body, then we'll go to shoe as far as that goes. But um, pronation wise, you know, they're like, well, I'm an over pronator and you watch them walk or run. And it's like, no, you're not. You're just going to neutral and you don't have, you know, they don't have that rear foot valgus that we're looking for, which, which would indicate the need for that corrective shoe. I've had, um, I've actually had a bunch of patients uh, that would, you know, go through a running evaluation somewhere else. One of them, this one guy I remember, he was from New Jersey. So we went through a running evaluation and they put him in Mizunos. And Mizunos are very, very, very stiff. And they gave him a pronation control shoe. And, and I hate those shoes. You know, I tried to wear them one time. They were terrible um, before I knew, you know, any of this stuff when I was in school. Um, so I watched him run and um, he needed a neutral shoe the entire time. So what was happening is it was forcing him as he landed slightly supinated, good running form that way. It was forcing him to slam down into pronation because mm. the shoe was just so stiff and he developed posterior tibialis pain from that. So, you know, I told him, I said, you're not going to believe me. You need different shoes. And he's like, what? You know, he couldn't just couldn't believe that I pushed him away from pronation control shoes. Um, and you know, the majority of people that I find, um, it, you know, they're, they're fit with shoes or pronation control shoes based on what their foot looks like, not based on what their foot does. And that's what I say. I say, I say, you know, look at your foot. I understand you've got a, you've got a, you know, falling arch or it's a little bit low, you know, it doesn't look ideal and doesn't look like a perfect foot for running. But when you run, you're supinated, you're supinated, you're coming down, you're not over pronating, you are, you're in the completely wrong shoe, but they, you know, they, yeah. um, just based on what their foot looks like, not what they actually do. So. That is, I think that's probably even its own episode of this because Definitely. again, another like it's just 12 hour long episode about uh, <laughs> the shoes, the shoe industry and how it's doing such a disservice to our runners. Uh, but yes, I completely agree with that concept. We talk a lot about uh, it not being an over pronation issue and that people really need to strike that from their vernacular. It's really about the speed that you pronate and whether you actually get back into supination with appropriate timing. So it's really about more speed and timing because pronation for people who don't know what pronation is, we should probably even talk about that. Basically 
pronation is when your foot, people will define it as your foot rolling in or your ankle rolling in. But what it really is, is there's a bunch of different movements that happen in all three planes because we're three dimensional, right? So all three planes, motion happens in each of those three planes in the foot and ankle that causes that foot to roll in. And when that happens, certain bones in your foot sort of unlock and that allows your body to your foot to become flexible so your body can then absorb shock the way it's supposed to so you want to pronate you don't want to walk, run through the gait cycle with a supinated rigid foot because supination is the opposite of pronation still a triplanar motion but it makes the foot rigid and allows the body to uh, propel itself forward from a rigid platform so there's certain timing points in the gait cycle when you want pronation to be occurring, certain points when you want supination to be, to be occurring. What happens is people get so weak in their foot and ankle that they can't control that motion appropriately, and then they start to have, have problems. And some of those problems are shin splints, knee problems, hip problems, low back problems. Lots of things can be attributed to inappropriate timing and control of pronation. But what the foot industry has done, exactly to your point, is, talk, is they try to fit for the shape of the foot, which makes no sense whatsoever. It's not talking about the function. And we, uh, one thing Aaron and I talked about on our, our last episode, we were talking more about what Run Lab does. We've actually developed a full body fit process and we're working on a patent on it because nobody's doing anything like this, which is crazy because we should be looking at the knees, we should be looking at the hips, we should be looking at the range of motion in the body to understand what kind of shoe that person needs to be in that will be a catalyst to improve their mechanics. The idea is not to just you know, wrap their foot in something squishy and send them out or something that's going to stop pronation or whatever, you know, like you said, motion control shoes, pronation control shoes. What even is that? Why are we trying to control pronation? The idea is working, strengthening the body so that there's not so much stress on the areas that are being injured. And the shoe should help that process, should not try to stop the body's natural motion. So yes, very big flawed approach in the industry. And to your point with Mizunos, I think that's interesting you say that because those shoes typically run so narrow as well. And one issue I see with a lot of, I think Aaron, you and I might've talked about this too, but one issue I see with like a lot of Nikes, people who have real pronation control issues, a lot of them love Nikes because Nikes are cute and aesthetically pleasing and you know, they've, they've killed it on that side of the market. But at the end of the day, so many Nikes have a really thin midsole. And if you have control issues, you just roll right off the inside of that shoe. And so they're just basically hitting airspace every time they get through mid stance. And it's really hard on the tip posterior and the muscles in your shin basically to control that motion when that midsole is that thin. So somebody who's got the pronation control issues like we talked about do so much better with a little wider base, but it's not something anybody's even looking at in the shoe fit industry and on the shoe wall. It's such a frustrating thing. That yeah. whole thing is the whole, the whole industry is flawed. So stop going to shoe stores, start talking yeah. to us first, and then we'll help guide you in the right direction. Dude, yeah. You know, know we have a, the bus all day. <laughs> yeah. We have a local store here that um, it, it's fleet feet. And I, I know they're a national company, but the, the approach that they have here is I think different than almost any store around. And they hear they, they'll, they'll fit your foot to the shoe, but after they think, you know, the shoes right for you, they make you walk and they watch you walk and, and they don't claim to be, you know, we're not movement analysts. We just want to make sure that it's right. And if you have problems, you go back and they, they, they change things. And if they can't figure it out, they are the first people to refer you somewhere to, you know, to get uh, in more in depth look. We've so. got some guys downstairs too, at one of our locations here in Austin that are the same way. They are really good about working with us in state mm -hmm. because I have always felt like people should not be buying their shoes online. They should definitely be buying from retailers. But the problem is retailers, retailers are not working with the medical community enough and kind of staying in the lane. They know technology of shoes better. I would never tell somebody exactly what shoe to run in because those guys know the technology. They know the shape of the shoe. They know all of the things that go into making that shoe up. But what I want to be able to do is hand them our spec sheet of all of the things that that person needs for their body and have them then choose the shoe, not do the biomechanical analysis, the gait analysis, whatever, by some 18 year old kid that just, you know, ran in high school and loves to run and is like, yeah, let me tell you about your pronation and your big toe. Like, you don't know, you really, you, you tell me, you tell me what pronation even means and then we'll start that discussion, you know? So I think that, uh, I, I shit on them all the time as, a, as an industry, but at the end of the day, I, I want people to buy from shoe stores. I just want shoe stores to say, hey, we're not the biomechanical experts, we're the shoe experts. Let's get that you guys in the hands of the biomechanical experts and let's work together to help this industry. You know, otherwise, what are we doing? 
So yep. that's, that's my beef with shoe stores in general. But I think there's a place for all of us and we can work together really well. Like you guys have found with Leap Beat, we found with Rogue downstairs. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So. Um, yeah. Um, we could, we could go all day on pronation. Um, I know. We could definitely go all day on pronation. My favorite, <laughs> you, know, you mentioned Nikes. Um, I love, you know, vapor flies. They're the coolest shoes ever. I don't know if you, if you, what, what your thoughts are. And we don't, we don't necessarily have to talk about that, but I love, I'm at a race and I'm running and, and oddly enough, Aaron and I both run in vapor flies because both of our feet are, are kind of conducive to them, which is, is yeah. kind of funny. Um, but I love people that are just over pronating so bad in vapor flies falling out of their shoes and they've squished the inside <laughs> so bad on the heel. Um, that's my favorite, but they bought them. So they're making we see fast, it so. all the time. That's yeah. right. You know, who's the worst about that triathletes? I used to, I used to, they will buy, if they can buy speed, Aaron knows if a shoe is $250 and they're like, oh yeah, that's going to buy me four seconds. Like they will buy three pairs of those. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. So I, uh, back in the, in the day of start when Newton started, I was yeah. back, I was in triathlon at that point in my life. And I was very much that way. I was like, all right, you know, this is like the golden shoe for everybody. So Newton's were $250 back then, you know, and nobody did that. It was a ridiculous thing. Anyway, and they had those four giant lugs on the bottom of them, you know, to try to get you to land on your forefoot, which is the whole concept. They've, to, to their defense, they have gone a much better direction with their current uh, shoe line and what they're trying to do. They're finally scaling back from the idea that everybody should land on their, on their forefoot on these giant lugs. Um, we actually, I, I had a shoe store at one point in this whole journey, and we actually had a... Uh, a deal where people could bring their Newtons in, their Newtons and their Brooks Beast. They could bring either of those shoes <laughs> oh, in. Gosh. We would give them a hundred dollars to take a new shoe off the wall, and then we had a bonfire with all those shoes in the back. Like that's how <laughs> bad I feel like those shoes are. So I just I, but I understand. Like triathletes love the Newton world because they came out with this kind of thing of like, oh, you get faster, blah blah blah. But you also, along with that speed, comes Achilles tendinopathy and calf strains and everything else. You know, because you're not taking the load away, you're just moving it around. And I think yep. that that's what, that's another problem in the shoe industry is that they're trying to magically solve things. And the vapor flies, another example, people are like, oh, this, you know, the magic shoe. I run in them too. I actually really like them. But yeah. again, if you have pretty decent mechanics, you can almost run in anything. Our elite guys that are running these like 215 marathons, like they'll run in whatever shoe company gives them the best contract, right? Like they don't pick the shoe that they're going to run these trials in. They pick whoever is going to sponsor them. And then they run great because they have great mechanics. They work on the foot that goes into the shoe, not just the shoe. Yeah. So anyway, I know we went down like way down the shoe road instead of the knee <laughs> issue, but oh, at the end good. of the day, it's the shoe the thing is like, it's so related to the knee problem that I just think it's, it's something to be talking about in, you know, in context of knee problems because it yeah. really is related. Um, the other thing, the other thing I was going to mention about knee pain, I, we have a lot of people up here. I mean, and you can tell me your thoughts on this. People just roll the daylights out of their IT bands, um, yeah. all the time because they have lateral knee pain and, you know, yeah. we, get, we get a lot of anterior knee pain and typically I see a lot of running form with that. Then, then we get a lot of lateral knee pain and once again, running form, glute weakness, we could, we could go back and forth with this, but, um, I've actually seen a big incidence of trigger point stuff and just the lateral quad um that refers pain i mean straight down to that that pole right down there where where they always have it um and they come in and they tell me oh, i've been rolling my my it band it's all my it band um that's the problem and and you know i i think that's the biggest overdiagnosed mis well over misdiagnosed is what we'll call it um running injury is it band syndrome so what are your thoughts about that Agree, agree, agree. So, and, and the other issue is that, I don't know, we've, we've both been through uh, school and had a lot of anatomy and cadaver dissection and things that you know as well as I do that IT band is not stretchy tissue. That's not no. something that you're just going to go in and roll out and stretch and nor do you want it to stretch. The thing is people don't quite get the concept if they're not in the medical world that the IT band is meant to stabilize the knee, not to create flexibility and range of motion in the knee. And so what happens is people start getting pain around their lateral knee. And of course, they're diagnosed with IT band syndrome. They're told they need to foam roll. Their friend tells them, you know, they're running weird and they need new shoes, blah, blah, blah. They go down this whole road. They post on all these beginner runner forums and everybody spouts off about what they think. And then, of course, a year later, they still have knee pain. Well, yeah. again, the knee, the IT band has, you know, for people that are watching this and don't know the, the anatomy piece, the IT band is just a big old piece of connective tissue that attaches on the outside of the knee, but
but it's got muscle tissue up at the hip. And so if, if, and it's got muscle tissue on the front of the hip and the back of the hip, and it makes kind of this little V. So if you have problems in either one of those areas, either a weakness or a tightness or whatever, it starts to create aberrant motion in that IT band, which can pull on the distal end at the knee. And then you start getting pain there. But this, you know, goes back to our earlier discussion that it's almost never at the knee. That's the problem. It's usually something above or below that's tugging on the tissues at the knee. And, you know, to your to your point, a lot of times the it's really the quad. It's not even the, just the quad is right underneath that IT band tissue. A lot of times that's part of the problem. And the, the IT band is, like you said, it's the culprit. It's, it's so so often not the culprit, but it's often diagnosed as the culprit um, by people who really just aren't looking at what's going on with the mechanics. Because it's a really easy just, oh yeah, lateral knee, obviously IT band. But yeah. not only are, are they missing the diagnosis, they're missing the treatment protocol because stretching and foam rolling the IT band is not going to do jack for it, you know? So <laughs> I think the other thing we see on the gate mechanic side of that is that people who are crossing way over midline. Yep. So if you're running and if you cross way over midline, you can picture that that IT band, because it comes from the hip down to the side of the knee, it's just being put on constant stretch over and over and over again and over, you know, five miles, 10 miles, 20 miles, one mile, whatever it is, that's a lot of load. And if you combine that with something like too much tibial rotation or, or timing of pronation that's off and weak hips and everything else, that IT band is under a lot of load. So it can be the IT band that's the problem, but just foam rolling in and rubbing on, it's not going to fix it. You have to solve yeah. those movement patterns and the mechanics. So we see a lot of that. And yes, I think it's overdiagnosed for sure. I think when it's correctly diagnosed, it's then mistreated, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, and then I see people utilize a very, very dense foam and even a rumble roller in those particular scenarios, which is, <laughs> yeah, if anything, you want a super, super, super soft. So another thing that I do see is people just, if they do rumble rolling on that particular, do not do it. Yeah. I yeah. see people coming in bruised. I mean, they have bruises all up and down their leg. I'm like, what did you do to yourself? They're like, well, I'm trying to get rid of my IT band pain. I'm like, just stop. Let's, let's, let's fix this the real way instead of that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they don't even usually go all the way to the hip. You know, they don't go to where yeah. the muscle tissue even is. So they're essentially just bruising the crap out of their quads yep. and, you know, uh, pushing on the inflamed area. That's just, it's going to create more issues down the road and, and even temporarily. It, it's yeah, it's a, it's, it's a problem. Treatment, treatment for IT band stuff is, is a problem industry-wide for sure. Agreed. Definitely. Definitely. Those are, those are probably the main, the main uh, knee pain points that we see, you know, when we're talking about most common, there's all kinds of little weird things, but I think at the end of the day, um, yeah, uh, gait issues related to too much rotation in the tibia related to weak ankles and, and pronation timing problems, um, over strides causing anterior front knee pain, uh, uh, runner's knee type of symptoms, um, uh, overstrides, I think, related to that, and then IT band issues, yep. but, you know, may or not, may not actually be the IT band, but all related usually to either the, the ankle or the hip, almost yeah. always. Because if you think about it, unless, you know, if you're, if you're somebody who's out there running around with knee pain, unless you had a blow to the knee, the knee, like, again, is really just kind of a hinge joint with a bunch of stuff connecting and trying to stabilize motion. So you're not, the, the, the motion in all these different planes is happening at the foot and ankle and at the hip. And so you got to control that motion. You got to be strong in those two areas to take load off the knee. So I think that's just like kind of the take home that we can send people with is it's not always the knee and stop asking people on forums for medical <laughs> advice. I was going to say, I wanted to, to reiterate the point, seeing a professional in the case is your best point, not just jumping onto the internet. Yeah. Uh, Yes. <laughs> yes, that. <laughs> well, I think that for a first episode, that's a good place to start. That's a good place to finish. I think that uh, we're going to continue to move forward with this and we're going to touch up and down the body. So today. That's we, not creepy at all, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you got to do what you got to do. Right? <laughs> They're going to get more listeners or fewer listeners. I don't know which one. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're going to come in, in groves after that one. <laughs> I'm sure we'll lead with that next time. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're, we're looking at calling this whole series Running Amok because it's going to be running related and we're just having fun with the name, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll, uh, we'll continue to put out a couple of these a month and 
again, we're, we're looking to feed what you guys are looking for. So if there's things out there that you have questions about that you want us to spend time and discuss, do not hesitate. Either reach out to us or put it into the comments of the previous video. What we will do is then dedicate the next video towards those topics to make sure that we continue to provide that quality content and information to allow you guys to get the best out of this series. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, Sounds we want to uh, definitely thank uh, Dr. Davis for, for joining us. This has been this has been a lot of fun. I, I think it's really cool to see complete difference in location, but almost complete agreeance on on topics and everything like that. That's pretty, pretty cool to see. And, yeah. and rare. It's nice to, it's nice to find the good ones and kind of stick together because I think we need, we need to be talking about this stuff in the industry. We need to change this industry. This is, you know, there are very few of us that are sort of thought leaders on this gate side that are really trying to push the envelope in this, uh, in this industry. And I mean, I started running as an adult and I was injured over and over and I started this company because I was trying to fix myself. And once I fixed all of my own stuff, I felt like, you know, there are 60 million runners in this company country and so many of them need what we're talking about. I think it's a really big deal and a big conversation. And I know that, you know, sometimes we piss some people off with the, the <laughs> concepts and the ideas, but you know, the people are just as injured as they were in the seventies. So we need to do something different. It's time to shake this industry up. And I think that, you know, I, I love talking about this stuff. So thanks for letting me, uh, let me be on here. Absolutely. Oh, uh, it's going to be good times. We're going to take advantage of it and we're going to educate people as we go. So that's the fun part about it. It's great. Well, we, right. appreciate, we appreciate you guys taking the time to view. As we said, we'll, we'll put another video here in the coming weeks, but ask those questions and we'll get to them. But you guys go out and make some magic. Yep. Have a great day. Soundstrap.